life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all. The naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails. Our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday.
Behold the men. Look at him. Observe him. I don't know if this happens to you, but I tend to forget that Jesus was a man. However, every Good Friday, I'm reminded of his humanity. Sometimes I think that we focus so much on him being divine that we suppress the fact that he suffered as one of us. As you know, suffering is one of the consequences of humanity's, humanity's sin. But Jesus never sinned. Nevertheless, he decided to enter into our suffering to deliver us from our fallen condition. In fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind. And he became a man of suffering. After the Roman soldiers took turns striking Jesus and saying to him, Hail, King of the Jews, Pilate brought him out from the palace to meet his accusers and said to them, in verse 4 of John chapter 19, See, I am bringing him out. So that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And then he said to them, behold the man. I want us to take a moment to, to behold Jesus. Who is this man standing before his accusers, beaten to the point of death, wearing a purple robe and a crown of thorns, being ridiculed as the carnival's king of the Jews? To begin with, he's an innocent man, for no crime was found in him. But even though the people in authority recognized that Jesus was innocent, they did nothing to stop the injustice. They ignored him as if he wasn't worthy of our attention. Just like many people today. Now, even though Pilate concluded that Jesus was innocent, the religious leader's consensus was that Jesus deserved to die. So they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. My brothers and sisters, that's still the cry out of many people today. Some people in our society despise Jesus and they openly seek to destroy him, to destroy his influence and his good name. In this case, the religious leaders told Pilate that they wanted Jesus dead because he had made himself the son of God. And as soon as Pilate heard it, he was even more afraid. I don't know if Pilate was afraid of the religious leaders causing a rebellion or, or maybe he was afraid of, of making a wrong decision about Jesus who really knows most likely it was the later. Is that you? Are you still undecided about Jesus? If so, behold the man. Considering him who endures such hostility against himself that we won't have to go through life without hope. But Pilate wasn't searching for hope. Pilate trusted his power. He was intrigued though. He approached Jesus again and asked him in verse 9, where are you from? 
But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate asked, you will not speak to me? Do you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Now, certainly Pilate had power, but soon he will learn that he didn't have the final authority over Jesus. For Jesus answered him in verse 11, you wouldn't have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. In the past, Jesus told Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world. Now he is reminding him that someone greater than Caesar has been ruling over the whole world throughout the ages. But Pilate wasn't ready to acknowledge Jesus as king. Nor he was ready to acknowledge that he had in front of him someone with a deep connection with the divine. That he was himself divine. Interestingly enough, in verse 12, from that moment on, Pilate sought to release Jesus. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no, not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. And after Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus before the Jews for the last time and said to them, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him. We have no king but Caesar. Can you see what is happening here? In order to see Jesus crucified, the religious leader said the unthinkable. We have no king but Caesar. The chief priest's hatred for Jesus led them to compromise their loyalty to Yahweh and his Messiah by publicly expressing their loyalty to a pagan king. So let me ask you. In what ways are you compromising your loyalty to Jesus? Are you at least aware of the ways you behave that are not impacted by Jesus ruling over your life? The religious leader's hatred towards Jesus blinded them. And by showing this supposed loyalty to Caesar, they put Pilate in a tough place. Now Pilate was forced to show his loyalty to Caesar as well. And that's exactly what he did. He ended up handing Jesus over to be crucified. Pilate's pride blinded him from being, from seeing the glory of Christ. That first Good Friday, hatred and pride became humanity's obstacles to behold Jesus, the man.
Redemption's Hill, where your blood was spilled for my ransom. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me, lead me to the cross. As I tempted and tried. The word became flesh for my sin in death. Now you're risen. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross, let your love to my knees, Lord, I lay me down, rid me of myself, I belong to you, oh, lead me, lead me to the
Continuing in John 19, verse 16. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Golgotha was a public place seen by all, and crucifixion, the most horrific of deaths, intended to humiliate and shame the criminal. The other gospels tell us that the two thieves initially mocked Jesus, but eventually one turned to him and trusted. He believed that Jesus was the only one who could save him. Verse 19 goes on to tell us that a sign was placed over Jesus' head saying, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It was written in Aramaic and Greek and Latin. So we have Golgotha, a public place seen by everyone and a sign stating the crime clearly above his head in three languages written for everyone to understand. This was a warning in Rome to the populace that this was the consequence of such scandal. Verse 21 goes on to say, so the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. I can't help but wonder what Pilate's thoughts were, who were influencing those thoughts. The Sanhedrin, his wife, his own personal experience in the presence of Jesus. What is influencing your thoughts about Jesus? As Jesus was hanging on the cross, the soldiers took his garments, divided them, and cast lots for his tunic. This was to fulfill the prophecy in Psalm 22, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. In just a few verses, we see Jesus as savior, offering forgiveness to the thief on the cross for everyone to see. We see Jesus as king, speaking truth to a Roman governor who was trying really hard not to believe. And we see Jesus fulfilling prophecy. As we move into verse 25, we see the heart of Jesus. We see Jesus as love. Verse 25, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. We already know that crucifixion was public. It was intended to be seen by all. So we know that Mary, the three other women, and John, the beloved disciple, were, were likely in close proximity to the cross. This wasn't an event occurring at a distance, but one that must have felt utterly surreal as the loved ones of Jesus stood close by and watched. Take a moment what it, to envision what it would, would be like to be standing this close to the cross, reaching out to your friend, reaching out to your son. In our culture, calling someone woman can come across as forceful or lacking respect, but that was not the case in the Hebrew culture. Woman was a term of endearment. It was a term that showed honor and respect. And that was the way that Jesus communicated with his mom in that moment. As the mother of four sons, I can't imagine 
what this would have been like to see your child suffering in such a way. Moms work diligently to nurture, to care for their children. And when that becomes impossible for whatever reason, as I'm sure some people in this room have experienced, it's utterly agonizing. Mary had given birth to Jesus. She swaddled him. She comforted him. She cared for him. If he fell down, she would have likely picked him up and bandaged his wounds. She and Joseph were were deeply concerned when he was 12 years old and they couldn't find him leaving the temple. Her life had been devoted to caring for and raising her children. And now in her son's moment of deepest anguish, she could do absolutely nothing for him. All she could do was watch, knowing that her presence might bring the smallest amount of comfort. If there was ever a time when Jesus could cry out for himself, this was it. And yet in those horrific moments on the cross, when Jesus was experiencing catastrophic suffering that goes beyond what any of us can ever imagine, his thoughts were to be concerned for his mom. Woman, behold your son. Mom, I know this is hard, but my thoughts are for you, and I'm with you in your suffering. Mom, this is my dear friend John. He'll take care of your needs. Even through her anguish and suffering, Mary knew why Jesus was there. And Mary also knew that her son would be her savior. Mary's song, The Magnificat, which she sang before he was even born, demonstrated that Mary was fully aware that she was going to give birth to the Messiah. She was going to give birth to her savior. Luke 1, verse 46, Mary sings, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. At the cross, Mary stood there looking at her son as a witness to his pain, his humiliation, his shame, his suffering, and his death. And she could do nothing to save him. Yet Mary also stood there with faith, with hope, and with trusting surrender. You see, Mary also needed a savior And while she could do nothing to save Jesus, Jesus could do everything to save her. And Jesus has done everything to save you and me.
Oh, the perfect Son of God in all His innocence. He walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Oh, blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who is, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the Lord, who would reach for me? Chased us down in merciful pursuit To the sinner you were grace And the broken you embrace And in the end the proof is in your wounds Yes, in the end the proof is in your wounds
don't let that phrase pass you by. There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. And I fear that maybe you've heard this story so many times that you no longer hear it. And that maybe that sounds like normal. It's not normal. God himself would clothe himself in human flesh, but not only that, would lower himself, be obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's not normal. Jesus has been crowned in thorns, beaten, spit upon, cursed at, and mocked. The king of glory crowned in shame. He's been on the cross for hours at the point where we'll pick up the story and he utters his two last phrases from the cross. Listen to John chapter 19 verses 28 and 30. Later knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he'd received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. In the English, it's three words. It is finished. And it it can be a a bit ambiguous as to what it means. In in the original, in the Greek, there's, there's really no debate about what it means. It does not mean it is over. It does not mean this is the end. Jesus is not crying out, I'm done. Actually, he's saying it's completed It's finished. Victory. See, there's a big difference. (laughs) In the moment that the enemy thinks he's won, Jesus actually declares victory. It's finished. He, He set out what he had come to do. He's claiming as he breathes his last breath that he has accomplished the very reason that he came into this world. Now, my guess is that you have finished something that you've worked at for a long time. Maybe it was a degree. It is finished. Maybe it was when that final child left home, right before they came back, you announced, it's finished, right? You retired from a job. It is finished. I think we know that feeling. It is finished. A few weeks ago, I, um, I, I ran, at least that's what I call it, I ran a half marathon at Lake Hodges. And when I crossed the line, I wanted to yell, it is finished. Maybe that's a bad example because I sort of felt like I was finished too. <laughs> but I think the natural question we probably should ask is what is finished? What is Jesus finishing on the cross? Let me give you two things Jesus is finishing. Number one, he's finishing the the taking away of the sin of the world, your sin and mine. When John the baptizer first saw Jesus coming, he pointed at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John declared from the first moment he laid eyes on Jesus that Jesus' mission was to remove sin. And up until that point, people didn't know how exactly that mission would come to fruition or to be accomplished. But there, hanging on the cross, declaring it is finished, Jesus tells us that's exactly how he would accomplish his mission of taking away the sins of the world. Out, arms outstretched, love holding your sin and mine. We know that's what Jesus was doing because that, those three phrases in English, those three words in English, it is finished, are actually one word in Greek. It's the word tetelestai, and it's actually an accounting term. It means to be paid in full. 
See, the scriptures are clear in using this metaphor or picture of our sin accumulating a debt, a debt that you and I could not pay. Friends, the good news of the gospel is that because of the blood of Jesus, you don't need to pay the debt of that sin. That's exactly what he does on the cross. So the apostle Paul would write to the church in Colossae and say, and you, and I would say it to you today, were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, but God made you alive together with him. Having forgiven all of our trespasses, how did he forgive our trespasses? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. There was a record of debt that stood against you and that stood against me. But when Jesus hangs on that cross, his blood drips onto that ledger. And instead of painting it in crimson red, it washes it white as snow. Because of the completed, it is finished work of Jesus. His completed work means you are completely forgiven. There is no sin left to atone for if you are by faith in Jesus. You might get a note from the IRS saying you owe more taxes, but you will never get a note from God saying we've made a mistake, you owe more for your sin. The accounts receivable department in heaven is closed for those who are by faith in Christ. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had made a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Oh, you guys, this is such good news. This is such good news because it means that if he has paid it all, then we don't need to hide our failure or our sin that we can come in honesty knowing and confessing, but knowing that we are forgiven because of the finished work of Jesus. He puts an end to guilt and shame. Therefore, there is now no, no, not like a little bit or not like a little bit, just a tiny bit. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Friends, forgiveness is freedom. And he won it with his finished work on the cross. There's a second thing it refers to also, that sin not only created a debt that we couldn't pay, our sin created a chasm that we could not bridge, a chasm between us and God. And ever since sin entered the world, humanity has been living east of Eden, as it were. Our sin makes a wall between us and God. But praise be to God. He repairs the breach that our sin created. And when he on the cross says, it is finished, he not only means that we are forgiven, but he means that we are also welcomed home. His arms outstretched, not only on a Roman cross, but his arms outstretched to you saying, come home. Come back. You're accepted. You're welcomed. Not because of anything you've done, but simply because Jesus did what he set out to do. Paul would write it like this in Ephesians chapter 2, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by his blood. So friends, don't miss this. He stood in our place so that we would never have to wonder where we stand with him. Welcomed, loved, accepted, forgiven. He has no wrath towards us anymore, no disappointment in us, no hatred toward us. We are brought home and he is overjoyed to have us in his house. 
And, and catch this. Because it is finished, that's true on your best day and on your worst day. You who were or are far off have been brought near. One word in the Greek to telestai. Three words in the English. It is finished. And yet, and yet, a mountain of meaning and implication. We are forgiven, washed as white as snow. And we are welcomed back into the family of God. And so we can echo with Jesus the final phrase that he utters. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Because it is fully finished, I and you and we can completely surrender. He's finished it. So we don't have to be worthy of it. We can simply rest in it and enjoy it and live from it. If he has finished his work, then I can rest in what he has done. Amen? Should I gain from his reward? I've got no answer for that. But this I know with all my heart. 
His wounds have paid my ransom. And every time we go to the table, we get to remember the sacrifice that he made, the love that he displayed, and the freedom that he purchased for us. And we get to remember that we step into it freely by his grace. If you didn't receive communion elements when you came in today, you could just raise your hand. Our ushers will um, bring some down the aisle to you. Let's see if I see anyone. We've got one right here. Wonderful. A few all over. You guys were sneaky getting in here. As we celebrate the table together this afternoon, and you have this, these scriptures in your mind of Jesus going to the cross for us in these pictures that you've seen of of Jesus being beaten and his mom reaching up for his feet. We remember the price that was paid for us. And I want you also to remember the love that was displayed. As we go to the table, we remember that the table is for those who are followers of Jesus, who would say yes to him. And we get the chance today to remember the fact that we say yes to him because he first said yes to us. And so, would you just hold these elements and just prepare your heart? We're gonna sing a portion of a song and then I'll come back up and lead us into the the bread and the juice. But I just wanna give you a few moments between just you and God. Would you just bring your heart before him? Thank him, confess any sin, and then we'll go to the table. This is communion, your body broken, the cup we're drinking is bittersweet, the gift of friendship, true salvation, born of your suffering on Calvary. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. Your body broken, the cup we're drinking is bittersweet, the gift of friendship, truest salvation, born of your suffering on Calvary. Remember the sacrifice of love. We remember the blood poured out for us. We remember the only Son of God upon the cross. From stain to spotless, from wrath to faith.
after supper, Jesus took the cup, he blessed it, and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, covenant of forgiveness of sins, which is purchased in my blood. And as long as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. Let's remember and proclaim. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the religious authorities, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, 
about 100 pounds weight. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen clothes with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there.